Thank you all for coming tonight to this public lecture organized by King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. Uh, we welcome our guest tonight, Dr. Uh, Professor Jennifer Keeney. She is going to speak about the 100 years later, the meaning of the World War I for the United States. Um, just allow me to give you a brief introduction to our guest tonight. Uh, Jennifer Keeney, she is a professor of history and the chair of the history department at the Champion University. She received her PhD in the history from Carnegie Mellon University, and she is a specialist in the American military experience during the World War I. Dr. Keeney has published three books in the American involvement in the First World War. Do Boys, The Great War and the Remaking of America in 2001, The United States and the First World War 2000, and The World War I 2006. She also the lead author of the American History textbook, Vision of America, History of the United States. She is currently working in the book detailing the Af African American experience during the First World War and has another project comparing and experience of soldiers from the French and the British Empire during the First World War. Dr. Professor Keeney served as associate editor for Encyclopedia for the War and the American Society 2005, which won the Society of Military History of Prize for the best, best military history reference book. She is on the advisory board for the International Society for the First World War Studies and serves as the book review editor for the Journal of the First World War Studies. She has received numerous fellowships for research, including Mellon Fellowship, Fulbright Senior Scholar Award to Australia and France, and Beveridge Research Grant and the National History Council Post Postdoctoral Research Award. So we're absolutely delighted to have you today. You. And I think we're going to have 45 minutes before okay. opening up the discussion for A and Q discussion. Great. Okay, Great. thank you. Please. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak about my research on the First World War and thank you very much for coming. So I wanted to begin uh, with this photograph because this is a photograph that was taken just about a hundred years ago today. And this is a photograph that actually represents um, an American soldier and sailor who are returning from the First World War. So the First World War ended on November 11th, 1918. And the United States, which had spent so much time building up this huge army and, and fighting and participating in the war, now had to welcome these soldiers home. And I, I like this photograph and I, I wanted to begin with it because if you look at the center of the image and you see uh, three generations here, you see a mother who's welcoming her children home, the men who have gone off to war, and then the soldiers, of course, holding his child. And it's interesting, I think, when, as an historian, when you consider how moments in history are transformative and how they really represent turning points to think about the, the completely different experiences that these three generations would have. You have a mother who came of age when the United States was industrializing, when railroads and, and steel, these were the major industries in the US, a son who went to fight in this war overseas that saw the introduction of new destructive weapons, airplanes, tanks, poison gas, all these new technological innovations, and then, and then a child who by the time he was an adult would live to see a man on the moon. And I make this point because there are such huge transformations in the lives of these individuals over the 20th century, and there's no way for them at a certain moment in time to predict what trajectory their lives would end up taking. For example, it could have been completely reasonable for this mother if she wanted a safe, stable career for her son to suggest that he become a blacksmith, that he learn how to take care of horses. And of course, within a mere 20 years, that would be a completely obsolete profession in a, in a society that had, into, had, um, had turned to automobiles. And this, this point that I'm making about these huge transformations is something that people coming into the First World War are, are not entirely prepared to uh, accept. People's conception when America enters the war in April of 1917 is that being a soldier means putting a gun in your hand and going and shooting at the enemy. But even something um, as, as complicated as the reality of trench warfare really demonstrates how much the military is changing, how much warfare is changing, and how much creating a modern military requires this huge, vast, um, complicated array of skills and vocations. 
So I love to show this image of trench warfare, which is the type of warfare that the Americans are preparing to fight in, in the Western Front. Because first of all, it shows you just how complicated the trench system was. Um, often, especially my students, have this notion that trenches are sort of two slits in the ground and people are facing off against each other. But, uh, but in reality, these are very complex defensive networks. And this trench network goes maybe 460 miles start to finish from Belgium to Switzerland. But if you take into account all the trenches that were dug, the estimate is that it's over 35,000 miles of trenches that were dug in order to fight this war. But you can see as well all these different technologies that are being introduced. And even something like a field artillery unit, which you can see kind of here in the corner, and artillery was the main weapon in the First World War. 70% of soldiers were either wounded or killed by artillery shelling. Artillery, the artillery batteries themselves sort of represent this diversity of skills that I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, because you needed men with physical strength who could load the shells. You needed um, people with great mathematical skills who could adjust the trajectory and do the complex computations that they needed at the front. You needed people who could fly and make the observations about where these shells landed, and then uh, you needed blacksmiths because these, these artillery pieces were pulled into position by horses, so you needed people who could take care of horses. So you needed, in a sense, not just one type of person. You needed people who had all different types of skills. And so for the United States, the challenge became, um, in its own mind, fitting the right man to the right job. How do you find these people very quickly? How do you assess their skills? And how do you then decide how they can best serve in this organization? Because as I'm saying here, the modern military is really turning into this very complex organization. And so, as I've said, we needed men who could just dig. You needed you needed men who were going to be either be thinking about employing these, these new technological weapons. Um, this is really emphasizing skills that deal with engineering, with brute physical strength. But I'm sitting next to a, a fellow history professor, so I'm going to also uh, uh, suggest that it was really important for the military to have people who were trained in the liberal arts, in history, in philosophy, in religion, um, in literature. Because all of these weapons and all of the things that people were being asked to do, it was not just a matter of the skill of knowing how to deploy poison gas or how to operate a tank. These new weapons and this new type of warfare was requiring um, people to answer big questions. And they were big questions that really only the humanities and social science could answer. Um, when should you use these weapons? How should you use these weapons? Um, these are questions about ethics, about morality, about international law. And these were the kinds of questions that people were asking during the war, and they were definitely asking after the war. And it would influence the type of strategies that were being pursued and the type of, um, of decisions that individuals would make on the battlefield when confronted with, um, with the, uh, the question of killing. So psychology became another important um, field that was introduced into the war with this notion about how do you find these people and the different tasks that they can do. It's, it's probably um, uh, important for us to realize that psychology, which is now accepted as a very legitimate social science, was in its infancy a hundred years ago. And a lot of people were uncertain as to whether psychology was a real, was really a science. And so psychologists offered their services to the military, basically saying, we can demonstrate our worth to society. And one thing we can help you do is find these people you need and put them in the right positions very quickly. And they did this by developing rudimentary intelligence testing. And this was the first example of mass intelligence testing and mass intelligence testing that could demonstrate its utility. And they demonstrated, they were able to demonstrate, these are examples of the tests that they gave, and they were able to demonstrate a very high correlation between people who scored well, so these would be the people who received an A on the intelligence tests, and then how they did an officer training camp. 
And this appealed to the US Army because it seems to imply that you it, your merit mattered, your intelligence mattered. It didn't matter what your class background was, it didn't matter how much money your family had. If you were a poor person but you were very bright, you could take this intelligence test and you could prove that you had the capabilities of leading. And, and because America perceives itself as an, a land of opportunity and people can pull themselves up, this fit very well with the ide ideology of the, of the society. And it seemed to demonstrate the usefulness of this new field of psychology for the military. And in reality, this had a huge impact on all of American society and, 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 and the educational system because schools subsequently became very interested in these tests. And if you, if you have, if some of you who have maybe studied in the United States or thought about studying and take, have to take these standardized tests like the SATs, well, this is the beginning of that because the SATs come out of this intelligence testing tradition, this notion that you can test people's aptitude and their abilities, and this can help predict where they're going to actually go. But as they were introducing these intelligence tests, they revealed some surprising things about the United States which actually suggested inequality and inequity rather than this notion that everybody can rise and climb. And that was that they discovered that many people could not take these tests because they could not read. And so therefore, high levels of illiteracy and the failures of the American educational system were revealed by this, this, this practice of intelligence testing. And this is kind of a complicated chart, but what it basically shows is that, especially if you're a black African American, there's a, a very large, high percentage of people who are, who are com considered completely illiterate, but even many poor whites who, um, especially recent immigrants, who were, not, who were not literate. And so they had to adjust and create a second set of exams that they didn't expect to have to create, which were sort of pictorial exams, which were also intended to assess people's intelligence. And this is a test um, where you're meant to fill in what's missing. So it's, this is gonna uh, sort of, one of the examples, and then there were also a lot of, a lot of um, analytical reasoning tests with patterns and things like this. Um, and this also had a huge impact on America because it seemed to link the lack of education to national defense. We can, in, in moments of national defense, we are at a disadvantage if we, if we have uneducated people coming in who cannot deal with the sophistication of a modern military. And so subsequently, as I'm saying, you see the school systems developing an affinity for these intelligence tests, you also see finally all states in the US having compulsory schooling laws. And so the idea that now you have to make sure that your citizenry is, is educated um, becomes a very important idea in America. And you can see the difference in the Second World War. When the second, in the First World War, the majority, of, uh, you had a, a huge number of people who had not even finished fourth grade. And by the time you get to, the, to World War II, um, most soldiers coming in have a high school education. And so just in this 20 year period, you see a huge um, expansion in terms of education in the United States. Now the, um, oops, sorry, go there. Now the, uh, the other big challenge with this, this problem of illiteracy was lack of English language skills. And this reflected the fact that the United States had just experienced a historic wave of immigration, mostly from uh, southeastern Europe, and, and these were people who had tended to live in their own ethnic neighborhoods, speaking their own languages. They had had very little exposure to mainstream American society, and now suddenly the country realized that when you bring these people into the military, and one out of every five soldiers that came into the First World War uh, military was, was foreign born, that this also presented a problem for national defense. Now there always had been an interest in Americanizing immigrants, but people had never really been completely sure about how to do this successfully. And the military in the First World War presented itself as the perfect Americanizing institution. That this was a way that you could pull people from different ethnic neighborhoods, put them in the same units, expose them to the English language, expose them to an education, and also teach them what it means to be an American. 
And when we think about what it means to be any nationality, it's more than just what we call ourselves or even where we're born. It's that we share the same values, we have the same history, we tell the same stories. So all these things have to be taught to these immigrants. And that's what the army did. It sent these immigrants to school to learn American history because in their formulation, you could not be American without knowing American history. And even to this day, if you become a naturalized American citizen, you have to pass an American history test. And in fact, there's many studies that show that uh, while immigrants do very well on this test, many American students do very poorly. So <laughs> maybe this says something about teaching of, of history more generally. But this is an interesting exercise that um, soldiers went through. I'm not sure if you can actually tell. Of course, this is the shape of the Statue of Liberty, a symbol of the, the opportunity that Americans uh, offered these immigrants, because many of them came through Ellis Island, which is where the Statue of Liberty is right next to it. But this photo is actually of, uh, taken because it's 40,000 men who are standing on X's on the ground to make the formation of the Statue of Liberty. So if you look now, you can probably see them, that they're all individuals. And so this was taken from an observational platform, and then it was sold uh, as propaganda during the war to kind of literally demonstrate how immigrants were turning into Americans by serving in the military. And I wanted to just share with you one really quick story of a particular individual. So this is a this is an image of uh, two American soldiers standing with a bunch of French soldiers. And the soldier I want to talk about is this one here on the left. And his name was Wilfred Depaté. And he had come to the United States from Quebec uh, when he was eight years old with his family. And he had come with his family to go immediately to work in the textile mills in Moose of Connecticut. And he, so he's one of these, these people who is foreign born. He uh, does not attend school past fourth grade. He barely speaks English, not, not high literacy. He goes into the military and he has this experience of finally coming out of his French speaking community, coming into contact with other Americans. And when he comes home, he's able to uh, make an application, excuse me, uh, to become a naturalized American citizen, and he uses as evidence of his dedication to the United States his honorable discharge from the military. Right? So this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about, and I share this story with you because that person is my grandfather. So it shows that, in a, you know, that, that for many Americans, they have these very strong personal uh, ties to this moment in history, which change the trajectory of their family lives as they move forward um, in the 20th century. Now, I'm talking, these are, these are ways in which creating this army uh, changed American society in terms of the character of the army, the educational system, the value given to certain disciplines, and then I'm giving you a suggestion about how it can also change immigrants' lives and, and personal lives. It was certainly true that the war also had an important impact on American women um, in terms of needing not just to create an army and pull men in to fight this war, but also needing to mobilize your home front and ensure that all civilians, in a sense, were, were supporting the war through their, in, their endeavors. And women were involved in the war in several different capacities. In one way, women were important in terms of symbolizing why America was even involved in this conflict. If I back up a little bit, um, you may know that the war actually began in August of 1914, and it did not, I mean, the United States did not get involved in the war until April 1917. So for two and a half years, the United States had stayed on the sidelines trying to decide whether or not it should fight in the war. But there were things that happened during this period of neutrality that publicized, or excuse me, that, that convinced a large number of Americans that the Germans represented a threat to civilization. And that if America did not get involved and stop them, that eventually this threat would, would come to the United States. And the images of women as victims of German aggression were very important in terms of conceptualizing for Americans a sense that they had a higher purpose in entering this war. And so these are propaganda posters, um, one that is referencing the German invasion of Belgium in 1914, where there had been well-documented atrocities committed against women. And then the second um, is an image that connects 
that comes directly from the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915. The Lusitania was a British passenger ship that was traveling from New York to England. There were Americans on board. It was torpedoed by a German submarine. Uh, it sunk very quickly off the coast of Ireland and it killed uh, uh, about 1,800 people and, uh, and 128 Americans. And so this is an image that sort of comes from a newspaper account. Because the, the ship was sunk very close to the coast of Ireland, there were bodies that were washing up on shore for several days, and newspaper reporters were there um, writing stories about this. And so this is an image that comes from one of those newspaper accounts of a woman who washed up on the shore clutching her newborn baby. And so these were images that really portrayed women as victims in the war and, and, and suggested that uh, America needed to fight to protect, to protect these, these victims. Yeah. Now once America entered the war, we also saw some, some uh, images of women uh, that really focused on motherhood and the idea that mothers understood the importance of their sons going and protecting uh, the women of Europe and also protecting the women of America, and so offered their sons uh, voluntarily to do this, and in fact were proud of their sons for fulfilling this masculine responsibility. And so these are two images. One is from sheet music. Uh, songs were a very important tool of propaganda in the war, and the other one is uh, from a mother uh, buying a liberty bond, and both of these suggest that women, that mothers, are very gladly offering their sons to the nation. So these were important images because, in a sense, they did not challenge the traditional role of women in American society in any way. One was that men are the protectors of women, and the other is that it's a man's responsibility to fight for their country, and women understand that. And so there were many ways that, the, at the time, that gender roles were actually reinforced as opposed to challenged. And this came uh, in other imagery where, these again are propaganda images, where it's the, the family that is venerating, uh, celebrating the, the father in both a white family and an African-American family who has gone overseas to fight to protect them. And, and I just, I just mention these images because I think sometimes when we, sorry, there we go, uh, when we want to focus on the changes that take place, and I'm going to get to that in a second, we lose the balance. And we should really understand that um, uh, the war, while it changes some things, it, there are other things that it strengthens. And this dichotomy in this, at this moment, that men fight and women stay at home, this is still the, the traditional uh, separation of roles that is reinforced by this experience rather than challenging. And I think this poster is actually very indicative of that. Man, man from this home is with our fighters. Women in this home is saving food. And this would be a sign that people would put in their windows. And so, so this is really nothing very challenging about that. But that second part of this, women in this home is saving food, did suggest that women had m more responsibility to support the war than just offering their sons, that women had to do something as well because it was a total war situation where what the home fronts produced and how the, and what, how the home front supported those men at the front were as essential to victory as the men themselves who were doing the fighting. And this is where we started to see opportunities for women to challenge their traditional roles in society because they were being told your support and your labor is necessary to win this war. And once you say that, then women start stepping out of the home into the public sphere in new ways and this is what begins to create some changes. And so a lot of these uh, propaganda efforts were, get, were trying to get women to do um, things with the domestic economy. Um, this is one which says, which talks about food conservation. Uh, there was no formal food rationing, but the notion that the home front had to change its eating habits so that some foodstuffs, like especially wheat, could be sent overseas, both to help the soldiers, but also to help uh, uh, European civilians who were starving. So there was a huge campaign to get Americans to switch to corn-based recipes. 
And then this other one here, which is about knitting. Knitting was this crazy thing that everybody got involved in in the First World War. This idea of knitting socks for soldiers who may be in wet trenches and don't, and, they, and if they, their feet are, are wet too long, they may develop trench foot. So how could women be providing them with socks and, and uh, uh, sweaters, things like this, to help them in, in the front lines? And to a certain extent, some of this was necessary, some of it was not. But what was interesting about it is that all of these campaigns to reach women were run by women. So women were not just you know, told, OK, cook different things for your family or knit different socks. But just the idea of organizing the women in your community to do these things, this required female leadership. So women became leaders in their communities to organize these efforts, and they developed a lot of leadership skills as a result of that, and suddenly became voices of authority and very important people in their community who, could, who, who had access now all the way up into the highest levels of government. So even in the highest levels of government now, suddenly you had female, female uh, uh, figures who were the head of women's divisions, but nonetheless, this is a time before you have elected female officials, you don't have women in the cabinet, I mean, women don't have the vote yet in American society um, nationwide, and so suddenly you have these women who are being elevated into these positions of leadership. And this, this, uh, this came about because of the necessity of, of having women involved, but it ended up being, being very, very important. Um, and so besides these, this idea of women you know, organizing in their traditional sphere, we also saw women beginning to step into new, new areas. And some of that had to do with actually participating in the armed forces. And so women could found opportunities to actually volunteer for uh, service. And so we had nurses, of course. This was the most visible way that women put on uniforms and actually traveled overseas and were considered a part of, of the actual military. Um, and we had women beginning to drill at home as part of home defense units. And then, of course, uh, and then the last photo here is women that were brought to France to serve as telephone operators, which was a skill at the time. And they also had to, they were translators, so they had to be able, they had to be bilingual in French and English in order to work as these telephone operators. And so these were, these were ways, they were a minority of women, there's not the majority experience. But these were, these were uh, young women who found new opportunities to work in different fields. And, and of course, there was an effort to put women into, um, excuse me, into uh, factories. This is the one I like the least. It's usually what people talk about first, this idea that women worked in factories. I like to talk about this the least because working in a factory in 1918 is not liberating. <laughs> It's 10 hours a day, it's hard, dirty work, it's not an enjoyable job. And so this notion that suddenly women got a chance to work in harder jobs in factories represents progress, so always, I'm, that's problematic. Um, and also, a lot of women didn't want to do it. Um, this is actually a poster which is, which is, which is trying to make, make women feel guilty about not wanting to go work in a factory. So, so yes, there were women that worked in factories, but it's actually difficult to get a lot of women to want to do this job. And I think in some senses, it's an over-romanticization of what factory work actually entailed. But we, so, so we did see definitely new economic opportunities. And of course, the biggest thing that happened for women because of the First World War was, was, this, was what happened to the, uh, to the suffrage movement. And the suffrage movement, um, got a big boost from the First World War. It, it, this is a movement that had been in existence for a long time in the United States, and it, it had had reasonable success by 1917 by, uh, with state referendums, which was the notion that the way that you were going to win the vote was state by state. And so you were going to go to different states and have referendums, and, and that this would be eventually how women would get the vote. And it was during the war that the entire suffrage movement came to the conclusion that it would be faster and, and probably, the, and there was a good chance of success to push for a federal constitutional amendment. And this would be in one, with one amendment, every woman, every woman could uh, theoretically have the right to vote in the United States. And there were two different um, tactics that were pursued by the suffrage movement. <clears throat> there was one, 
which is represented by this image and actually by one of the photographs out there, which, is, which was the moderate wing, which said what we, we should do is volunteer and, and be very visible in the war effort. So we should, we should be nurses, we should be on these committees, and while we're doing this war work, we wear our pins that say we're suffragists. And we will basically win the war, excuse me, win the right to, to vote by arguing that you are asking of us all the responsibilities of citizenship <coughs> without giving us the rights of citizenship. And so this was the argument that they made and, and they persuaded an important person with this argument, Woodrow Wilson, who came out in favor of, of female suffrage during the war. There was also a radical wing of the suffrage movement which took a different tact and that was that they refused to participate in the war at all and instead they protested outside the White House, um, picketed it actually, um, by pointing out that Woodrow Wilson had said this war was intended to spread democracy. And if this is a war for democracy, how could he, Wilson claim this when women were denied suffrage? So there's a lot of debate among historians about which group ultimately made the most difference. The um, 19th Amendment, which was ratified in 1920, um, and some people argue that the radicals actually made it harder. Other people argue that they were the ones that really tipped the balance. This is the great work of the historian to try to interpret um, the meaning of these different acts. But, but, but the fact was that uh, you know, two years after the war ended, women finally did uh, uh, receive uh, the, national, the federal suffrage in the United States. Now this same dilemma between the notion of fighting a war for democracy internationally when some Americans at home are denied rights also clearly affected African Americans during the war. And so African Americans during the war, like the suffragists, made the same argument to Woodrow Wilson, how can you be claiming this is a war for democracy when, when we have racial segregation in the United States, legalized segregation laws, especially in the South, that really delineate where whites and blacks can, can go and the rights that they have. So one thing that the first, the first World War did for African Americans is it generated a huge demographic shift in the United States. Because of the, the war had cut off immigrant labor coming to America, just at the moment that all these factories are gearing up to produce war goods, there was a labor shortage. And labor agents went down to the south and recruited African Americans north. And so this is an image of what became known as the Great Migration. And the Great Migration is this movement of half a million African Americans from the South, where the vast majority of African Americans still lived, still lived often in the communities where their, maybe they or their relatives had been slaves, and generated this, this massive migration north. And so this, this new, new creation of, of large African American communities in the north, where people could vote and where they had more freedom, not complete freedom, but more freedom, this is a, ma a movement that's generated by the First World, World War. Um, and then, of course, African-American soldiers serve in the American military alongside white soldiers. Um, well, I shouldn't say it that way. I mean, the Army is racially segregated, but they're drafted as well as, um, as white soldiers. The vast majority of these soldiers are put in non-combatant positions. 89% of African-American soldiers will serve in jobs like this, where they basically wear work overalls and they're unloading boxes from ships. They're not doing anything that's very glamorous or is going to win them very many medals. But there are uh, African-Americans who fight, and these African-Americans receive a lot of notoriety in the United States. And here I have a, another story I wanted to tell you about a man named Horace Pippin. And Horace Pimpin fought in a, in a unit called the Harlem Hellfighters. This became a very famous African-American regiment in the First World War. And it fought for 191 days at the Western Front, and that was longer than any American regiment. And the reason that they fought for that long is because they did not fight with the American Army. They were a unit, one of four units that was given to the French. And they fought under French command. And it taught these African Americans that the French had a very different notion about relations between blacks and whites than Americans did. And so they felt by going to France that they had learned that it could be possible actually to be treated equally and well. But Horace Pippin, besides that experience, was in combat a long, long time. 
and he came back quite damaged from the experiences that he had had overseas. He had a terrible final experience in combat where he went in, he was shot in the right shoulder almost immediately, and he fell into a shell hole where he lay for 12 hours, and part of that time, he lay with a French corpse on top of him because a man had come, seen him lying there, and a German sniper had shot the French soldier through the head, and the guy fell on him, and, he, and then he was just stuck. So he came home very traumatized from these experiences, and he was a poorly educated man, and, and he, he says in this quote later, I can never forget suffering, and I will never forget sunset. So I came home with all of it in my mind, and I paint from it today. And what he chose, the way he chose to heal himself and to express the trauma that he experienced was through painting. And Horns Pippin became a very famous painter <coughs> of, of, um, subsequently, and this was the first painting he ever completed. And in this painting, he shows the destruction of the Western Front, but he also shows, and I hope you can see this, the soldiers that are surrendering are German soldiers, and the soldiers that they are surrendering to are African-American soldiers. And so he's also demonstrating, besides the trauma he experienced, the fact that African-Americans could fight bravely, valiantly, and they could be victorious. And these were really important things to demonstrate to America at that time. But what Pippin was thinking about was equality. And I want to suggest to you, just like I suggested to you that we that's, that sometimes historians over-romanticize the chance to work in a factory. I think sometimes when we talk about African-American history and changes from the war, we focus on equality. But actually, there was more to it than that because there was also the question about not just would black soldiers have a chance to equally fight, but would they have a chance to lead? Would they have a chance to be officers? In other words, what about the idea that sometimes a black man is smarter than you and has more authority than you and actually can command you? That's not equality. That's about hierarchy, which, of course, is what the military is structured around. And so this question about the ability of black officers to become of black men to become officers was also raised during the war. And so this is a group, of, they were successful in getting one officer training camp for African-American soldiers, and really important people came out of this training camp. And one of the most important people that came out was a man by the name of Charles Hamilton Houston. And he was the youngest officer to, uh, to graduate from this camp, and he went on to be a captain in the field artillery of an all-African-American uh, unit. And he wrote after his experience when he came home that during the war, he went in very idealistic, and then during the war he said, I made up my mind that if I got through this war, I would study law and use my time fighting for men who could not strike back. And Charles Hamilton Houston is such an important person because when he comes back and he goes to law school and he becomes a law professor at Howard University, he also becomes a legal consultant for the National Association for Colored People, the NAACP. And he is the architect, he is the person who comes up with a legal strategy for a very famous court case in American history, Brown versus Board of Education, which rules that segregated schools are unconstitutional in the 1950s. And his beginnings of his activism in the sense that I have to do something like this with my life starts from his experiences in the First World War. And so, so you can see just through his life, but I think this, this idea of leadership really matters as well. Can Americans see black men as leaders? So I think that there is a, a legacy and a line that goes from somebody like Charles Hamilton Houston to somebody like Colin Powell to somebody like Barack Obama. And these are not people that are equal. These are people that are better, right? They're above. And that's a big transformation that has to take place in American society as well. Okay, so my last two points, you're probably waiting for me to say that. <laughs> my last two points um, have to do with thinking about not just legacy, because I'm talking here mostly before about changes that are, get initiated in the First World War and how they snowball over time, but more to think about analogy and to think about parallels between uh, dilemmas and challenges 
or perspectives that Americans had then and perspectives that we have now. And I think that often when we study history, we want to know how we became who we were. But sometimes we study history because we want to understand our situation better. And that's more thinking about, uh, less about lessons, but more about parallels and, and what can we see about uh, the similarities between our times. And I think that one of the things that we're really seeing right now is this question about immigration in the United States. Are immigrants an asset or are they a threat? And this was a question that I think it's raised in both of these periods because if you look at this chart, this is showing that both in the time of the First World War and now, that, we, that Americans are experiencing historic highs when, of the foreign born being a, a, a significant part of the American population. So we've had a significant, I mean, people are coming from different places now as, as, as in the First World War era. But the idea that immigrants are a, a significant percentage of the population approaching uh, you know, 15%, that, that this, this starts to raise questions then among Americans about what's going on. In the First World War, we could see two questions. One was the threat question. Germans had come to the United States in large numbers. And once we go to war against Germany, the question is, who are these Germans and German Americans? Are they loyal Americans? Are they spies? Are they saboteurs? And the truth of the matter was that there were German spies in the US and they were blowing things up. There were great acts of sabotage, uh, terrorism we would call it now, in the United States in the First World War era, organized by the German government. So on the one hand, there was legitimacy for being concerned. And then, of course, there are people that went crazy with that and just started attacking neighbors and, and people who had been living in the US for three generations. But that poster here, you know, don't talk, spies are listening, really associates immigration again with a threat. And this other image, it's probably hard for you to see, but this is Uncle Sam who's watching these immigrants walk through, coming off the boat from Ellis Island. And he's basically saying, am I Americanizing them or are they Europeanizing me? And this is the cultural question, right? Can, if, how many immigrants can we assimilate and how much, or how, will immigrants end up changing our culture so, that, so much that we don't even recognize it? This is, this is the dilemma of the time. If you look at today, Americans are concerned with a lot of these same questions. Um, with this, with this map of the US, you know, what is the cultural impact of immigrants? That's what Americans are being asked. And does it, make, does it make America better or does it make America worse? And while the majority of people say they make America better, it's important to, because of the way American um, electoral politics work, especially our presidential elections, to see the distribution in state-wise. So I come from California, a state with a, lot, a, high, a large immigrant population. People overwhelmingly say, yes, immigrants you know, make America better. But you come into uh, some other areas of the country, um, people answer that quite differently. And you know, if you you could superimpose sort of like a red and blue map in terms of, of presidential politics, and you could you can see why Im the question of immigration has become so significant in our current national conversation. And the same thing: do immigrants increase crime in local communities? And the overall figure is 58% say no. But if you're a Democrat or Republican, you're going to answer that question very differently. So these are questions, and so these are similarities, I think, that we see between these errors, and how, how are we going to handle it? In the First World War, in the 1920s, we enacted very strict immigration quotas. These, this is why that, 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 that graph, that line goes down, because we restricted immigration very dramatically for the next uh, 30 years. Um, and of course, now we're in this big debate about should we be building a wall um, in terms of halting immigration from South America. So this idea that, that there needs to be a response as people are worried about these things, I think that this is a, an interesting similarity between these two areas that can open up some fruitful conversation. The second and last uh, area I want to talk about is the parallels I see between this questioning about America's role in the world. It's my contention that Woodrow Wilson is a significant president in American history because he articulates a rationale for America to play a significant role in the world. On the one hand, his rationale is national defense. We have to defend ourselves against threats. 
But his other rationale is that America is exceptional and it has an exceptional role to play in world history. And he bases this on our democratic values, but also on our, our, our wealth, our generosity as a people, and our humanitarianism. And, and in his rhetoric, these are the two themes that he brings up again and again. And so I also think that there are important parallels here between our time and, and, uh, and the past. Uh, in terms of humanitarianism, Americans were very concerned about this plight of, especially of refugees during the First World War. Um, and, and even in, in, uh, in, in Syria and the Armenian uh, uh, genocide and, and then certainly what was happening in Europe. And so you saw these massive relief efforts that were being organized and they were mostly private relief efforts. It was not a government funded initiative. Massive, massive amounts of aid that went. And I especially like to point out to American audiences that this trend continues today. Americans have the idea that the government is the primary generator of overseas aid, but actually private donations are a much greater percentage of aid that Americans send overseas than governmental aid. Americans continue to uh, give quite generously to uh, philanthropic endeavors. And the other big parallel, I think, between then and now is this question about uh, this, this image that Americans have of themselves, of, of the many wars that we fought in the 20th century, that we come as liberators, not conquerors. And this is a self-image that Americans continue to embrace. And you can see it in all these images I'm showing you, which is the first, it's of American soldiers posing with German children after Germany has been defeated. We are liberating the German people from the Kaiser. Um, the liberation of France and then the liberation of Iraq. These are, these are things that Americans believe very strongly in and I think that they really uh, uh, are testimony to the way that the Wilsonian vision has still been such an, uh, an instrumental part in terms of how Americans conceive of the role that they need to play uh, in, in, in the world. So, I, so I, I, I end my, my comments. I hope that I convinced you that history is super important to study and that the First World War is exceptionally important to study to understand uh, modern America. Thank you very much.